Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Mohammed Imam from Surrey, United Kingdom. Dr. Imam is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Royal Bristol Orthopedic Centre in Surrey, UK. After specialist training in the UK, Dr. Imam completed fellowships at the Wrightington Upper Limb Unit in the Royal Orthopedic Hospital, Birmingham, which was followed by fellowships at the Mayo Clinic and the Stedman Philippon Research Institute at Colorado, United States. Dr. Imam has several publications and book chapters credited. If you've noticed, Dr. Imam has delivered a lecture on our channel, which was an engaging one and already reached a huge audience. And today it's my great honor to bring back Professor Mohammed Imam for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Mohammed. Thank you very much, Tej. Thank you very, uh, for the lovely introduction and for the great work you're doing. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending uh, this lecture, which I enjoy talking about, uh, which is reverse shoulder replacements. We're going to quickly go through history, rationale, and advances of reverse shoulder replacements, which has became day after day a, a common procedure done more and more frequently all over the world, especially with the longevity of uh, uh, especially with uh, uh, the elderly population we're serving nowadays. I'm, go I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the rationale and the advances of reverse shoulder replacement. We want, wanted to talk about complications, but that might be a different lectures, uh, lecture to talk about uh, later on. So what do we know about reverse shoulder replacement so far? We know more and more day after day now. A key concept describing the mechanics of the normal shoulder, which is crucial to understand what we're going to talk about here, is the concavity compression concept popularized by Metzenital. They describe this concept as a ball sitting in the concavity of a table. The greater the depth of the concavity, the greater a displacing force must be to dislodge the ball for a given compression, a compressive load. In the normal shoulder, the rotator cuff muscle provides a compression, the comp what we call the compressive load, as you can see in that picture. This is lost, as you can see here, in rotator cuff deficient shoulders, leading to instability resulting from the unbalanced muscle forces acting in the glenohumeral joint and that would lead to the proximal migration of the shoulder joint. Another key aspect that we need to understand is what also proposed by Madsen and Libet, which is the concept of the glenoid center line. Uh, in, in normal glenoids, the center, uh, in normal glenoids, the center line represent a line perpendicular to the articular surface of the glenoid and directed on average approximately 10 degrees posterior. That's why we call it retroversion to, in regards to the plane of the scapula. The center line serves as the pillar under which the humeral head rests. And so glenohumeral and scapulothoracic motion are coupled to maintain the center line beneath the humeral head throughout the shoulder range of motion. In a rotator cuff deficient shoulder, unbalanced muscular forces disrupt this relationship. And this mechanical alteration can lead to pathologic wear, patterns on the glenoid, consisting of a spectrum of disease from nowhere to superior, anterior, inferior, and posterior, or even global wear. Ideally, when you're doing your reverse shoulder replacement, you should place your glenoid component along the glenoid center line. However, in cases where there is glenoid bone loss, component placement in this plane might not be possible. And in cases of severe or eccentric bone uh, glenoid wear, a stable-based plate fixation can only be achieved by placing the component along the alternate glenoid center line, as you can see in C here, and D, figure C and D. A third component important are alteration from the normal uh, shoulder mechanics can be seen in cuff deficient shoulders, which is the concept of impingement. This can occur between the greater tuberosity and the acromion, leading to acromial erosion or what we call acetabularization as the head is articulating with the acromion. And so 
in patients who have lost the dynamic stabilizers of rotator cuff muscle, the humeral head migrates superiorly and leads to apartment underneath the acromion. And in these cases, we, we only have one option, which is a reverse shoulder replacement. So the commonest indication for reverse shoulder replacement still rotator cuff arthropathy. And one of the most commonly used classifications, which is most widely accepted, is the Hamada classification. In grades one and two, it's mainly based on acromial humeral distance, whether it's more or less than six millimeter. In grade three, you can see see the acetabularization I'd mentioned. In grade four, you have narrowing of the glenohumeral joint, and in grade five, there is complete, uh, there is collapse of the humeral head. So this is a case of rotator cuff arthropathy, but there is a wide spectrum of the disease that can be seen in rotator cuff arthropathy. And this spectrum can actually go into arthritis or instability as per this diagram. So, what about reverses? So let's talk briefly about the history of reverse shoulder replacements. Charles Neer was the first one who popularized the concept of, uh, of a shoulder arthroplasty. He wasn't the first one who did a shoulder arthroplasty. The first one was actually done by uh, a French surgeon, Jules-Emile Pian to treat tuberculous arthritis of a 37 years old. But the first introduction of such implants was by Charles Neer. However, the problem here is when there was calf deficient uh, shoulders, these components failed badly. And then different surgeons and scientists all over the globe have been thinking, how can we achieve a stabilized center of rotation? And that led to a lot of attempts many of which are actually based on uh, the total hip replacements because they wanted to provide a conceptual framework to improve understanding of a shoulder replacement and how we can achieve a stabilized shoulder replacement using different concept over, uh, concepts over the year. But the question wasn't really answered because many of these designs has failed to achieve a longevity stabilized shoulder replacement, mainly because of the excessive torque and shear force on the, at the glenoid component bone interface. It was up till this guy, Professor Gramont in 1985, who with the help of two scientists have introduced this concept of stabilized center of rotation by achieving a medialized center of rotation through distalization of and distalization of the humerus and that ultimately lead to decreased shear forces on glenoid component bone interface and greater liver arm of the deltoid which has been the concepts which has developed from delta 1 to delta 3 over the years. And that has put the deltoid at a superiorly biomechanical advantage that enables the deltoid to, uh, to contract, causing abduction, and overcome a deficient tendon, a deficient rotator cuff tendons. And you can see here center of how to mobilize, distalize, center of rotation. It is medialized and it is distalized. So what are the indications of shoulder replacement? This has been increasing over the years. Cuff arthropathy and fractures remains the most common, the commonest indications, as well as revision surgery. Reverse shoulder replacement would be as our salvage for most of fixations and uh, so replacements done in the shoulder. Rotator cuff arthropathy remains the main indication as per, uh, the, per evidence and as well as fractures. And looking at fractures, 
the functional outcomes of reverse shoulder replacement has been significant. Something to highlight based on our work uh, during my fellowship with Professor Gerber, that actually salvage uh, reverse shoulder replacement in younger than 60 years is associated with a higher complication rates and can lead, although it can lead to durable improvement beyond 10 years, but you have to warn your patients that the risk of complication in this cohort of patients is high. So what are the contraindications of a reverse shoulder replacement? These are the top contraindications for reverse shoulder replacements. Active inject infection would be the absolute contraindication. Deltoid deficiency wouldn't be, uh, would be a, a big contraindication unless uh, you undertake simultaneous procedures of tendon transfers. So what do we need to do when you see a patient with a reverse shoulder, with a problem in their shoulder and you're considering going for a shoulder replacement? So it's all about clinical judgment. You have, we have to introduce the concept of diagnostic clusters popularized by Puneet Munga and, their, uh, and Len Funk in their book, uh, Diagnostic Clusters in Shoulder, which is the, uh, the act of using all aspects we have, all tools we have in our hands as surgeons in making sure you have strong indication for a shoulder replacement without obvious contraindication in the right patient. AP radiographs, which I undertake for every patient I see. CT scans is crucial to identify the pony structure and identify cases with glenoid loss or retroversion in order to be well prepared. It's crucial to identify the center of uh, rotation and glenoid version. We popularized this uh, concept of uh, the ellipse modification we published in Bone and Joint, the Bone and Joint Journal, and uh, which enabled us to identify the center of rotation, and we found it to be more uh, uh, very accurate in identifying the problem. MRI scan, I only do it when there is an indication for doing an MRI scan. And nowadays we have different tools in our uh, hands. We have uh, different programs that would enable us to properly assess for and preoperatively plan for the components, especially when you have a complex case where you might be a bit worried identifying where about you should go for your shoulder replacement, where about you're going to position your components and you want to understand if you use these specific components and if you do this osteotomies, uh, how much range of motion you're going to achieve in these patients, which is great tools and many companies have them now. So then you have to define which approach you have to do. I personally would go for the delta vector approach. It's workhorse and extensile, and the delta vector will enable you. Uh, which we, we, uh, if you, for the unfortunate, if uh, unfortunately you have a fracture, you can extend your approach. It enables you to see the inferior glenoid uh, properly, associated with slightly less risk of less risk of uh, axillary nerve injury. It is the same approach and it is the workhorse and all shoulder replacements. What you need to do here, what I tend to do in most of these is to release the pec major, identify the long head of biceps, which guide me inside the shoulder. There are different techniques in uh, uh, approaching the shoulder. Uh, there is a cap, a subscap peel. There is a, you can just go through the soft tissue. You can do an osteotomy, which would be better for uh, healing uh, of uh, the subscap, although you can still use soft tissue anchors. There is also different concepts about whether or not you should, and there is no consensus nowadays of whether or not you should repair the subscapularis. After going through the subscapularis, it's really important to identify the three sisters uh, inferior to subscap just uh, near the long head of biceps because that can be a, bad, uh, a cause of bleeding which might be hard to retract. I'm aware of a surgeon who 
had uh, uh, bad bleeding because they didn't identify the three sisters uh, properly. Uh, you know, you have to do proper releases here, stick to the bone to avoid axillary nerve damage. Uh, and uh, you have to, your first osteotomy actually here is uh, your first release is, is taking the osteophytes out. You don't necessarily have to identify the axillary nerve in all of these patients because if you take the osteotomy, sorry, if you take the subscab out of the way, the axillary nerve is far away from uh, you. Do your releases, take the labrum out and uh, it is really all about releases and good exposure of the glenoid, which will enable you to achieve uh, better outcomes in these patients. You can push the subscab out of the way. And uh, after uh, doing, now you can, even before doing that, uh, you can uh, release uh, the labrum from anterior and posterior, as well as the, sorry, anterior and superior, as well as the capsule. I personally now tend to do uh, uh, humoral osteotomy before doing any work on the glenoid aspect. It's really important to take your time, stick to the bone to avoid injuries uh, to any uh, structures there, but uh, it's all about the uh, exposure of the glenoid. Uh, at the end of the procedure, one crucial aspect to bear in mind is actually intraoperative assessment of stability. We wrote uh, these two techniques, uh, these two tests uh, by uh, which was popular, uh, but these two concepts, uh, the bit shuffle test and the lateral thrust test by putting your fingers and pushing the shoulder is a humerus stem out, you can assess for stability. Pushing it up, it can assess for stability. And these are the tests I would do in most of my shoulder replacements, because, especially uh, and reverses, because these tests, if you, if you use all of them and you are happy with the majority of them, uh, understanding what to check for and what are the management options as per this slide, you can understand very well what to do. And actually looking at the conjoint tendon, doing the bit shuffle or lateral thrust test, chuck test is very uh, popular as well. Testing in uh, abduction, external rotation, abduction and internal rotation, all that will give you a better idea about the patient's daily living using these components. So what are the results of shoulder replacements? We wrote uh, five years follow-up of 159. We found that 35% uh, of uh, shoulder have notching and we'll go through it uh, later on, which is better than actually previous cited figures. And maybe that's because of newer concepts. We found that the majority of patients are having a significant uh, improvement in the scores without obvious complications. So what is notching? We, we can understand now the concept of notching. And actually, if you look at the concept of notching, uh, we are going to go through it in details in the next slides. So where are we now from before, from the Gramont time? So when Gramont made his design, there were four key issues. These range from notching, rotation, instability and lengthening. And we found that notching was a big problem. Instability was documented to be a high problem and limb lengthening was another concern with the stylization of the humeral component as well as the center of rotation. And that led Frankel, a shoulder surgeon in the US to popularize the concept of lateralized reverse shoulder replacement. And you can achieve lateralization here, either on the glenoid or the humeral side. So if you look uh, uh, on both sides, we'll go through it in details later on and during this talk. So you can achieve that through glenoid lateralization. And humeral lateralization, there are different tricks that you can enable you to achieve that. So which one should you opt for, humoral or lateralization or medialized center? 
we'll, we'll go through the pros and cons of each in the next slides. You can achieve glenoid lateralization either by using board graft like bio-RSA, which we're going to talk about, and metallic grafts. And that has led to different and huge variety of replacements that are available in the market now. And we have different options, modular, a different angle, modular monoplug, different uh, different angles, and uh, different uh, implants and uh, graphs that you can use both on the glenoid and the humeral sides. If you aim for glenoid lateralization, you definitely will achieve less notching, which is which will go uh, or. Uh, we will achieve better rotation, better shoulder contour, and less instability. However, you are at risk of reduced abduction and glenoid loosening. If you go for humeral lateralization, you will achieve better rotation, less arm lengthening, less notching, better shoulder contour. But you're at the risk of instability and reduced abduction. So what about the advances? So Pascal Polo, this is one of the advances I'm going to talk about in shoulder replacements. He thought about notching, which as per the previous talk, uh, slides, we were worried about more. So he popularized doing a bone graft on the, using a bone graft and doing a pio RSA so that you have the center of rotation within bone. So it is a mixture between the medialized center of rotation and lateralized center of rotation. Because you can do humeral lateralization or glenoid lateralization, but if you do humeral lateralization, you can, you can do it by doing reduced neck shaft angle, curve stem, and what we've talked about. But with bio -RC, the center of rotation is here kept as a glenoid bone processes. And once the graft is healed, your center of rotation is actually here. So it is balanced between medial and lateralized concepts. So why notching was a problem? Because in earlier results, scapular notch was observed in 60 shoulders in this study, which is 88%. In our study, we found it to be 35%, but we didn't find it to be associated with lower scores or lower clinical outcomes. So when you have the problem of notching, how can you bio RSA help it? Let's understand notching quickly. So notching is actually mechanical impingement between the supramedial aspect of the humeral polyinsert and the inferior scapular neck. And you can see what happens here. When the patient are, is using their, their uh, shoulder, there is continuous notching going at, this, uh, at the, this end of the scapula. And so, and this has been popular, uh, uh, reported to be as high as 90% in reverses. And many have been worried that this would be a cause of revision because servo graded it into four grades, one limited to pillar in contact with lower screw over the lower screw and extended to base blade. So if you had grade four, the base blade is definitely loose. And then bio RSA aiming to increase the lateralization by having the center of rotation at the glenoid bone processes, but does it work? Quickly assessing the evidence. So theoretically, this should lead to reduced notching, better rotation, better outcome scores, and good associated with good graft healing. So Pascal Polo reported the results to be as good as 98% of cases have achieved healing. They also, uh, George Atwell compared standard uh, reverses to bio RSA. They found no significant differences in relation to clinical scores or range of motion. And they found notching to be definitely significantly less in the bio RSA group. Kersner retrospectively assessed bio RSA to the Gramont style they found no difference in functional scores, 
significant differences in prevention of notching and strong as to, uh, uh, and uh, actually prevalence in graft incorporation. Grenier looked at 34 patients, found no differences on evaluated parameters, and they actually found that there is increased external rotation in the bio RSA group, especially when excluding patients with degenerative tears minor. And they found strong bony integration, uh, majority of uh, grafts has healed significantly. And that actually led us to do this uh, meta-analysis looking at bio RSA. And what we found, we wanted to answer the four questions I've just highlighted earlier. Is it associated with better outcome scores? We looked at DASH score, American shoulder and elbow score, and we found in all uh, reported uh, papers, no difference. And then we asked this ourselves the second question, is it associated with better rotation? And we found no statistical difference. And then we asked the question of less notching. And we found that it was significantly, it is significantly led to decreased notching. And does it heal? The four, we found that yes, the reported evidence is 77 to 100% healing. So possibly by or RSA, it will, will heal, the graft will heal and it will decrease notching, but will it cause better rotation? Doubtful. Better outcome scores? Doubtful. Possibly can, theoretically can, but we need more evidence. The other advances we're having nowadays is actually navigation. And there are also a lot of uh, systems now looking at improving outcomes of uh, shoulder replacements pre-operative uh, programs like the one we've talked about, intraoperative navigation. And the main advantage of navigation here, because you are aiming to recreate normal anatomy, which you might not be able to achieve by doing the pre-operative assessment. You need, the problem with some shoulder replacements sometimes, especially if you're using superlateral aspect is that you might find anatomical landmarks a bit difficult. You, that, uh, that's why when I'm positioning my patients, I have to make sure the scapula is well fixed. You have to understand in cases where complex glenoid deformities and eccentric wear, you might not be able to reproduce the normal anatomy. Anuti has done a lot of work on uh, navigation and it looks like it is one of the coming advances in shoulder replacement. There is, uh, in, there is weak evidence that navigation has uh, associated with improvement in accuracy. We can, we all agree eyeballing might not be enough, but we have to make sure that all these systems are well calibrated before using them. We, it, it might be important uh, in identifying aspects you might not be able to see by eye polling, especially in uh, prolonged arthritic shoulders where the normal anatomy cannot be seen. If you cannot see the Friedman axis as a time of reconstruction, we might not be able to quantify or execute our correction, which navigation can help with. If you can see, possibly it will help you uh, improve the outcome of what you do for your patients. There are, you know, uh, there are newer uh, concepts as well, uh, like using virtual reality. And uh, I think, you know, more work is still needed in using virtual reality and artificial and machine, artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, uh, which I'm happy that we are actually starting to do some work in that regard at the University of East London in surgery and hopefully in shoulders uh, as well. So what do we need to know? Is it worth investing? I cannot agree more, but of course we need more work. So with this man is the one 
who has contributed the most to shoulder replacements, Professor Gramon. And we, there has been a lot of achievements since then. Yeah, and uh, we are getting better in understanding these problems and we can work harder to improve the outcomes we offer to our patients. This is my colleague, Ali Narvani, who is always would say, know your implant and do plan. And I've seen him do that continuously. Thank you very much. And that's what I tend to do myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, for yet another brilliant lecture. A uh, couple of questions, Mohammed. Sure. Uh, now, when you talk about bio-RSA, right? Uh, if you look at data by Pascal Bollet himself in uh, somewhere in 2006 to 2010, he said that the complications with the conventional reverse shoulder was very high, like around 15 to 25%. That was his uh, incidence of complications. And do you think that bio-RSA and techniques like that have reduced the incidence of complications? It's actually, you know, I still, I wouldn't use BioRSA in every patient I do. You know, you have to pick your players because, you know, still it will add the time. There is also, uh, your, uh, it, it will add time to your procedures. There is risks of, you know, graft not healing and stuff like that. So, but I think it's an option if you have, you know, and, you know, the alternative, as I've mentioned as well, would be metallic base play. You know, you can actually uh, lateralize components or, uh, you know, manage bone defects using metallic augments. So I think, you know, with the, with the sensible use of BioRC and picking up your players, of course, it will add time to procedure. Uh, you need to a better exposure for the glenoid. Uh, so I think, you know, there is criteria for selecting them. You know, we know from evidence that, you know, there are some, you know, I've read a paper recently saying that the complications of reverse shoulder replacement is low, but actually it's not low. You know, there is it's still a big uh, undertaking. You have to understand what you're doing and what are the challenges. And based on these, you can select your players. Uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, we can actually do a talk about complications and how to prevent them. I have, uh, we can in the next lecture, but I think we need to under, it's not, uh, you know, there was a big paper published uh, many years ago and saying that bio uh, reverse shoulder replacements is associated with a lot of complications, but the majority of surgeons in this paper published in GBJS America was actually cases done by, by surgeons who does one or two shoulder replacements a year. So, you know, you, you know, you, if I'm going to have my shoulder replacement done, I'll go to someone who does plenty of these. Thank you, Mohamed, for that. And what do you think are the changes in design that have taken place ever since Gramont has described it? And uh, what do you think have revolutionized those design changes? I think, you know, there are a few important aspects. One of the main uh, so one is the medialized center of rotation. So with the newer designs, of course, some surgeons still opt for the medialized center of rotation. And there are uh, claims that this is associated with long term uh, successful results. But, uh, you know, one of the market changes that we found now is uh, locking, play, locking screws in base plates because base plate uh, failures was a big issue in the earlier designs, but are now using locking uh, screws lock, uh, and actually using HA coated metal base plate have enabled us to have better etch, better uh, osteo integration in uh, reverses. The, also, we understand we have of course better biotechnology. We have we can use different aspects. We have uh, you know uh, better preoperative planning programs, which enables us to identify. Uh, problems and challenges before doing uh, procedures. We now have better and very rich uh, uh, evidence telling us how to avoid certain problems. So first, the uh, papers on notching cited it as high as 88%, while in our study, which was published a few months ago, we found it to be 75%. Uh, and now, you know, whether notching has an effect or not, possibly on long-term. Long In our study, we found no effect of notching or range of motion or uh, uh, functional outcomes at five years follow-up. 
However, others found that it is associated with lower outcomes. And, you know, I think, you know, there is more and un better understanding. So we have better implants, better designs. Surgeons are becoming better in doing whatever they are doing now. And we understand how to avoid these complications if we're doing these procedures. Thank you, Mohammed, for that. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Uh, do you do uh, a reverse shoulder for proximal humerus fractures? Because a lot of surgeons all over the world, they tend to do a reverse for elderly patients with severe combination, they do a reverse. And in those cases, suppose if there was an axillary nerve injury, how do you really pick it? Because axillary nerve dysfunction, the reverse doesn't work, right? Yes. So, you know, the point is here, there are, very, this is an excellent question. And there is, you know, I've just, I'm just reviewing a paper actually looking at a similar question. So I think, you know, uh, if you cannot reconstruct the proximal humerus in a patient who, Hemiarthroplast wouldn't be the best option. I think now and more and more I'm doing reverses for fractures because, you know, it's not worth going for fixation and knowing that it will either go a vascular, you'll have a vascular necrosis, it's doomed to failure, and then try to take the plate out and then go for a reverse shoulder replacement, making, you know, and evidence is definitely saying you, this will lead to inferior outcomes. But, you know, if you have the, uh, an unreconstructable uh, fracture, uh, you can go for opt for a primary verse and you, your toprostis are broken. So the approach is done for you. You have amazing exposure to the glenoid and go for it. For axillary nerve palsy, I tend to ex try to examine the sensation. It's very hard in cases of fractures, but the majority of these injuries, uh, it is uh, neuropraxia. So usually it will recover even after a reverse shoulder replacement. And the other, you know, if things fail and you, you know, do a reverse and, you know, the patient is not happy with whatever you've done, you can consider other options. But I think nowadays there is a bit of shift into doing primary reverses for proximal humor fractures from what I've seen, at least in the UK, uh, and slightly in Europe now. Thank you, Mohammed, for that. And I think it's better to think that uh, uh, the axillary nerve dysfunction would be just a neuropraxy and it should recover. So then you are positive. It, it is the case, you know, I've done it. Uh, it is the case in at least 90% of patients. I don't have the right figure in my mind, but on the top of my mind, but I think it is the case. I totally agree. Thank you, Mom. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of surgeons all over the world. Thank you Thank so you much, much uh, for joining in. It's a pleasure. And, uh, you know, thank you for you and all the great effort you and your team are doing in orthopedic principles, which is brilliant effort uh, to educate people all over around the globe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone.